Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary. Would everyone please stand for opening prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we come before you and thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you that we can freely gather together to worship you and to hear from you as we go through your word. Father, we pray for the, the peace of Jerusalem, all that they're going through right now. Protect your people. And uh, Lord, uh, just uh, give them wisdom in all that they're doing. And as always, Lord, as we worship you this morning, we want to honor you through these songs. May our hearts and minds be focused upon you so we can receive from you. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. This morning we're going to read Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now in my prosperity, I said I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. I cried out to you, Lord, and to the Lord I made supplications. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3 as we continue our in-depth study through uh, Paul's second letter to Timothy. And again, Paul wrote this letter right before he was martyred for his faith in Christ by Caesar Nero. He was in the Mamertine prison in Rome. And so his words are very important, obviously. You don't put just garbage or fluff in a letter that's going to be your last one. And he wants Timothy to understand what's ahead, the battles he's going to face, because he's going to carry on the work of the ministry there at the church in Ephesus for a while. Now, to kind of set the stage, I don't know if you heard the story about the pastor. He went to the ICU uh, of a local hospital to visit a church member. And the poor guy was on life support. His prognosis was obviously not very good. And the pastor stood there at the man's bedside, and he was speaking to him for several minutes. While he was speaking, the patient got really disturbed and agitated. And finally, he reached for his little pad of paper, and he wrote a pastor, the pastor a note and gave it to him. Well, the pastor knew this guy was really upset, didn't want to stay there too much longer. So he prayed for him and left the hospital and slipped the note into his jacket pocket. A few hours later, he got, the pastor got a call that uh, the man had died. And at the funeral service, about halfway through the service, the pastor remembered the note that this man had written. He forgot all about it until now. And he reached into his jacket, pulled out the note, and held it up to the people at the funeral service for this man. And he said, look, I have in my hand a piece of paper that contains the last words of our brother. <laughs> well, he never read the letter. You see, what the man had put on the letter is, you're standing on my oxygen tube. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's probably why I was it, uh, agitated. But uh, last words are very important. And that's what we see here with Paul. Paul is just laying this stuff out, and there's so much in here. And when we were in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we spent some three studies just looking at our Christian character. What do I mean by all this? Well, in the midst of living in this world, and we're all in this world, how are we to live out our faith? What are we to be like? What should be manifested in our lives? And Paul gave nine points in what we are to be like, how we are to live out our faith. When people look at us, what should they see? And he told Timothy and us, 
about the soldier who is to be focused, the athlete who is to be obedient, the farmer who must be patient, and the message is about Jesus, the results of living for Christ is persecution, the way we stay focused is our hope of glory. The diligent worker who rightly divides the word of truth. Yeah, you have to be able to divide God's word correctly. The sanctified vessel who is sanctified for our master's use. And the gentle servant who is humble and gentle in his correction. Now, you may be thinking, you know, Pastor Joe, why is this so important? I mean, what's the big deal about the days we're living in? It is a big deal. And Paul's going to speak about this coming apostasy. And when he's speaking about apostasy, Understand, he's not speaking about the world, he's speaking about the church. He's a, those that claim to be Christians. And Paul wanted Timothy to be prepared for what he was going to face. And I think the Holy Spirit wants us to be prepared. In other words, things are going to get tough, it's not going to be easy, and we need to be prepared for what's coming. You know, I think this is very important. I realize some people have criticized me for warning What's going on in the world? They don't want to hear that. But how are you going to avoid what God is saying in the scriptures? I mean, every single letter, almost every single letter, I should say, in the New Testament is dealing with false teaching. So how do you ignore it? I mean, now we have to just get to the nice stuff. Yeah, but there's some bad stuff, too, that we have to be aware of. And so that's why I do it. Um, so what is an apostate? Well, Noah Webster from his 1828 dictionary, and I wasn't in school when that came out, but he said it like this, an abandonment of what one has professed, a total desertion or departure from one's faith or religion. That's pretty simple. A withdrawal from the faith and trust in the God of the Bible. Now again, there are those who claim that they believe in the Bible, they believe in God, they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe all that the Bible teaches. They don't believe the God of the Bible. They don't believe the Jesus of the Bible. It's what they've made up in their own minds, their own imaginations. We don't have that option. Either what God has said in his word is true or let's just all pack up and go home because nothing is true then. How, you pick and choose what is right and wrong. And you know what? What are we going to pick? All the nice stuff. But there's also some bad stuff. You know, we were in Deuteronomy, right? How many verses was 68 verses or something of curses if you disobey? Yeah, there's things that are not very nice. But what's happened is because people have moved away from God's word is they've fallen away now from the truths of God found in the word of God and they're moving away from God. And it looks like this. They'll, they twist scripture or pervert the truth to fit an agenda. They live a life counter to the ideals set in place for Christianity. And they're often marked by pride, flattery, cause division, and are more focused on things of this world than things from above. And Paul's going to tell us that those that have fallen away, this apostasy, they're going to manifest certain things in their lives that go contrary to what God has said in his word. And I hate to say it, but in the church today, apostasy is like a cancer and it's spreading quickly. And Christians seem to be more interested in their feelings, what they feel is right or wrong, rather than what God's word has said. Well, I just feel that's right. I can tell you from personal experience, my feelings are often wrong. Is God ever wrong? No. So why don't we listen to him? You see, it's as simple as that and as complicated as that because it goes against, well, kind of what we're going to be talking about today, the big problem, and we'll deal with that in a little bit. But once you start to doubt God's word, you're in trouble. What was the first place in the Bible that we see the word of God doubted? Genesis chapter 3 in the garden. That's exactly right. Has God indeed said? And there's the danger. Sowing doubt. It's not that Satan said that God didn't say this. He's challenging it. Hey, now you go look. Has God really said that? No, you can't believe that. Doubting. And so we depart from the faith. One writer said, have we reached this crisis point in the church? It's, 
or how have we, excuse me, reached this crisis point in the church? It's rooted in the German school of higher criticism, which invaded this country big time in the 1920s. According to the scientific approach of this school of skeptics, the Bible is not revealed the revealed word of God. Rather, it is man's search for God, and therefore it's filled with myth, legend, and superstition. Now you just got to find out the God you're looking for. But wasn't that religion? Everyone makes a God of their own imagination. And today this viewpoint dominates the seminaries of America. The Bible is not something that we study to believe and obey, but we analyze it and dissect it and criticize it. And it's lost its authority. And what they end up doing is they write books and go on Facebook and they deny the virgin birth, they deny the miracles of Jesus, his resurrection, his second coming, that he's God, that he paid for our sins. In fact, one, Bishop Sponge argues that Paul and Timothy were homosexual lovers. How crazy is that? But you throw that stuff out there, and you'll get some to believe. And that's the danger. Back in 1984 on the Phil Donahue show, Norman Vincent Peale was on. And he said this. He said, it's not necessary to be born again. You have your way to God, I have mine. I found eternal peace in a Shinto shrine. I've been to Shinto shrines and God is everywhere. Well, you know, Phil Donahue's not a Christian, but he was shocked by what he said, and he, almost, he came into defense of Christianity. He said, but you're a Christian minister, and you're supposed to tell me that Christ is the way and the truth and the life, aren't you? He nailed it, right? And Peel replied, Christ is one of the ways. God is everywhere. You see how you get that stuff out there? It's not necessary to be born again. But what, Je what did Jesus say? Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Who are you going to believe? I'm going to believe what God says. You see, there's... Let me put it this way. These guys are very good at deceiving you because they sound very sincere. They will you know, tell you, we, I know Hebrew and Greek, and this is really what it's saying. And they are lying to you. Can we understand the word of God in English? Oh, absolutely. What about Japanese? Those that speak Japanese, absolutely. Any language, they can understand God's word. Why? Because it's the spirit of God that opens up the word of God to our hearts and our lives. And if, it, if we had to know Hebrew and Greek to understand it and get saved, we'd be in trouble. But God's word is for everyone. And I like that. It's the literal word of God. And I trust it. And that's why I've been teaching it for almost 29 years now. It's sad. 20% of Americans now say the Bible is the literal word of God, only 20%. It used to be 24% in 2017. And 29% say the Bible is a collection of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. There's the problem. There's the problem. As you move away from the truths of God found in the Word of God, you open yourself up to anything and everything. So what the church ends up doing is bringing in worldly philosophies, worldly teaching, worldly beliefs. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. There we go. Um, and When you move away from Jesus is the only way, there's no virgin birth, Jesus is not God, the blood atonement is not true, that we're basically good people, and the list goes on, <clears throat> it ends up becoming a religion. And Satan loves religion. He loves it. Why? Because it keeps people away from the true and living God. He uses it all the time. So what happens and this is what we see happening in churches today. As you move away from the truths of God found in the Word of God, it affects how you live out your faith. And look at it. Look at those that claim, hey, I'm gay and I'm a Christian. Well, how could that be? I mean, I don't understand. And so it's interesting 
you don't trust what God's word says, you alter it to live a certain way. And I've heard people do this. I mean, when I was working at the hospital, someone gave me a, a letter from a, a Lutheran um, publication, and their premise was that the word homosexual wasn't around um, when they wrote the scriptures, and so how could God be against homosexuality when that word wasn't around? And so they gave me this letter, and I said, well, you, you know what the problem is? It doesn't say homosexuality. It says men lying with men and women with women. Do you understand that? I mean, but you see how they are putting that stuff out there. And you go, you go, well, yeah, of course the word homosexual wasn't in, even invented back then, right? Okay. Deception. And Paul, again, is speaking of those who are in the church who claim to be Christians, but when you look at their life, it's hard to believe that they ever came to saving faith. And so our study this morning is the coming apostasy. And I broken it down into four points, and they're in your bulletin. Difficult times in 2 Timothy 3.1, the problem in 2 Timothy 3, verse 2a, the result in 2 Timothy 3, verses 2 through 5, and apostates in 2 Timothy 3, 6 through 9. So let's pick up 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, and let's see what the Lord has for us this morning as we look at this topic, the coming apostasy. Paul wrote this, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, or times of stress. It's interesting how he opens this up. Know this. And in the Greek, it's speaking of constantly know, remember and understand, so that you always will be on guard and respond properly. You know, he's speaking of how to know what to do, which is based on the knowledge or based upon the Word of God. That's the idea. How do we as Christians know what to do if we don't know what we are to be on guard against? And that's why I take the time to warn. And I can't warn you about everything, but there are things that are really important that, are, that come down the pike that we have to be aware of. And Paul is warning Timothy, and I believe the Holy Spirit is warning us to be on guard, to pay attention. Why? So we can walk properly and, you know, use this warning as... Uh, just that, a warning. And he's focused on the last days. And so people go, well, when did the last days begin? Have they begun yet? And there's all kinds of ideas of when the last days take place. But what does the Word of God say? And please understand, the last days and the tribulation period are not the same thing. Um, and I'll show you. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We're told, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. The last days started with the ministry of Jesus, the incarnation, where God became flesh and dwelt among us, and they continue until the second coming. And think about it. If the last days began with the ministry of Jesus, Paul was living in the last days. Paul expected the rapture. He, he talked about it in 1 Thessalonians. When we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. He thought the rapture may happen in his day. But here we are, almost 2,000 years down the road. We are a lot closer, aren't we? I think we're towards the end of those last days. And when you look at what's going on, right is wrong and wrong is right, you can't say sin is bad. and In fact, we flaunt sin today in the face of God. And God has been very gracious. But, you know, God's not going to strive with man forever. Judgment will come. And we're going to see as we read verses 2 through 5 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, there are 19 general characteristics of man. A time of social deterioration, the wickedness of man's heart, is manifested in his actions. And so perilous times, times of stress, evil is rampant. In fact, the Greek word for perilous speaks of dangerous, hard to deal with, savage. And Paul's warning Timothy, it's going to come. And again, look at where we're at today. That's what Paul warned Timothy about in 1 Timothy 4.1. The Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith 
giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now think about that. When people believe false doctrines, do they really believe they're adhering to doctrines of demons? Absolutely not. But that's what they're doing. If it goes against God's word, if you believe Jesus, there are many roads to God and Jesus is just one of the many paths to God, that's a doctrine of a demon. Why? Because it's keeping you away from God. It's keeping you away from saving faith. And I believe the true church, church believers, not just one church or denomination, but they were going to experience more and more and more persecution as we get closer to the Lord's return. Not just from the world. I understand from the world but from the so-called church. And we even see that today, where they come against us. What do they say? Well, you're unloving, you're hateful. Look at you don't like these, love these people. No, it's not that I don't love them. I love them, but I'm not going to, I love them so much I'm going to tell them that what they're involved in is wrong and they need Jesus. That shows I love them. And, you know, Along these lines, one pastor talked about a book written by John Warwick Montgomery called Damned Through the Church. And he's speaking about the perilous times and offers a list of what he calls the damnable, damnable epochs of church history. And this is what he wrote. He, Montgomery, identifies and discusses seven specific movements, movements or theological orientations from the sacramentalism of the Middle Ages, also called the Dark Ages, to the subjectivism that is so rampant in our day that are cruelly unbiblical, ungodly, and destructive of the body of Christ. As the title of the book implies, these false gospels are damning to their adherents. In each of these perilous times, men's ideas were substituted for God's truth and therefore God himself. Under sacramentalism, the church replaced God. Under rationalism, reason was God. Under orthodoxism, God was sterile impersonal orthodoxy. Under politis politicism, God was the state. Under ecumenism, God was uncritical fellowship and cooperation among nominal Christians. Under experientialism, God became personal experience, and under subjectivism, self has become God. It would be appropriate to add to Montgomery's list the current emphasis on mysticism, which seeks to determine truth about God by intuition and feeling, and on pragmatism, which attempts to determine what is true by what produces desired effects. These movements do not come and go, but come to stay, so that as the years go on, the church accumulates them and the battles continue. Exactly. And so we keep adding this false teaching to the church, and what happens? What's the last day's church like? Well, we don't have to guess because we can look in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, and see the church of Laodicea where Jesus is not even allowed into the church. He's outside knocking to get in, asking them to open the door. That's how bad it is. This is how dangerous it is. This is why the warning. You know, these false teachers don't just come and go. They come and stay. That's the problem. And it's interesting because if you look at seminaries, and if you ever just do a study of seminaries and what they believe, they are teaching future pastors this garbage. So what do the pastors do? They come, they come over and they take over a congregation, and now they're teaching their people these things who then believe it. There's the danger. I hate to say it, but false teachers are nothing more than wolves in sheep's clothing because they're leading people away from God. People don't like that, but it's the reality. It doesn't lead to holiness, their teachings. But as Paul told Timothy, and again, the Holy Spirit, I think, is warning us, in 2 Timothy 2, verses 16 through 18, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like Cancer, Hymenaeus, and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. So these ungodly characteristics in their lives, and their apostate leaders in apostate churches. And, you know, maybe you're thinking I'm making too much to do about nothing, but 
It's hard to believe you don't see that we're living in difficult times. But if you're not seeing the problem, if you don't think there's a problem, the next point is the problem. <laughs> Look at verse 2. Just the first part. For men will be lovers of who? Themselves. Oh, themselves. Isn't that interesting? And Paul's going to list some, like I said, 19 points here regarding what the life is uh, for these apostates. And please understand, we can manifest these things in our own lives too. We have to be careful that we don't follow these things. But the key here is lovers of themselves, self-love. And this is not the unbelieving world, although they fit the picture, but Paul's speaking of the church, the last day's church in particular. It's leaders that will influence and infect its listeners with its deadly poison. The apostate church of the last days. And you know, we'll see as we read on, these apostates will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and they have a form of godliness but deny its power. So they look like Christians, they dress like Christians sometimes, and, but they're not, and that's the problem. And here's the thing. I don't know how many years ago, 20, 30 years ago, psychology came into the church. And what's the key to psychology? Self-love. Self-love. Give me one verse that tells us that we have to build up self in the Bible. One. You won't find any. We got this from the world. Sorry. What do we see? Crucify the flesh. Mm -hmm. Deny the flesh, right? That's the problem. Paul in Romans 12, 3. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. The Amplified Bible puts it like this. For by the grace, unmerited favor of God, given to me, I warn everyone among you not to estimate and think of himself more highly than he ought to, not to have an exaggerated opinion of his own importance, but to rate his ability with sober judgment, each according to the degree of faith apportioned by God to him. We stand and live by the grace of God. It's not about ourselves. It never is. Galatians 5.24, And those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Every day we wake up and we have to deal with the flesh, don't we? And if you don't think so, go drive on I-43. I, I guarantee you, you will deal with the flesh because we have bodies of flesh that we have to deal with every single day. And God says you have to crucify it. You know, the whole teaching on self-love or self-esteem goes against everything the New Testament tells us to do uh, with self. And they brought it into the church through psychology. In fact, the word esteem means to regard highly, to value greatly, to have a high opinion of. So self-esteem is to regard self highly and to value self greatly, to have a high opinion of yourself. We don't need to be encouraged to love ourselves because we already do. I shared this with you before. Looking out here, I know you guys all love yourselves because I see the way you're dressed, your hair is combed those of you that got here, and, you know, we take care of ourselves. We don't come in here, you know, wearing, please don't do this, wearing pajamas or whatever. We, we dress up, we look nice, because we have a high opinion of, we want to look nice, because self is important. And there's nothing wrong with taking care of yourself, okay? We're not to hate ourselves. The problem is, when we let that unholy trinity take control of our lives, me, myself, and I. And it's all about me. And that's what the church has become. The church is not about coming into a church and using the gifts that God has given you to bless the people. Now the church has become the people are consumers. And so what do you have for me? What can you give me? And when you can't give me what I need anymore, I'm going to move. And you know what? That's church growth today. We move from one church 
to another church. I'm going to go over to this church. I'm going to go over to that church. And when my needs aren't met anymore there, then I'm going to move on. Now, if you're not getting fed, that's a different story, but I'm talking about needs. It's about me. I'll tell you what, when I first got saved, and this was this is just me, I just wanted to serve. I knew nothing, absolutely nothing. We had a building where we had to take chairs and set them up and take them down. We rented a building. And the chairs were up on the second floor in a little attic, and we had to climb a ladder, go up there, hand the chairs down, and then when we put them back up, it was the greatest time. We had such great fellowship. It was awesome. And people miss that today. I'm, I'm very blessed here because, you know what, years ago I would be finishing the, the study and I'd pray, I'd close my eyes, which they tell me don't do, but I always do because this is me. And I open my eyes after I say amen and man, people are gone. Now I got to flick the lights to get them out of here. That's great because there's the fellowship you're sharing with each other. You know, it, it's interesting. You don't need a lot of counseling sessions when you have the body of Christ working together. Why? Because you share your needs with each other and you pray with each other. You get to know each other. You don't need the counseling sessions most of the time because you're helping each other out. Praise God for that. And here's the thing. Do you know what self-esteem, self-love was once called? We don't like to call it that anymore. Pride. Right? That's what it is. It's pride. Yeah, look at me. That's pride. Sorry. But we changed the wording and made it more acceptable and brought pride right into the church. And this self-love, self-esteem, pride is the foundation of all these other depravities. And that's what Calvin said. He said, but readers should note that lovers of themselves, which comes first, can be regarded as the source from which all the others that flow spring, follow spring. Exactly. So that's what we're going to look at next. What flows from this self-love? What does it look like? And we don't have to guess because Paul's telling us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, here's the result, in verse, starting in verse 2 here of 2 Timothy 3. And we're going to just start from the beginning of verse 2. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Again, it all begins with lovers of self, self-centered. And that's what we see today. Barclay said, It's no accident that the first of these qualities will be a life that is centered in self. The uh, adjective, uh, adjective excuse me, used in uh, philantos, which is the Greek, which means self-loving. Love of self is the basic sin from which all others flow. The moment a man makes his own will the center of life, divine and human relationships are destroyed. Obedience to God and charity to men both become impossible. The essence of Christianity is not the enthronement, but the obliteration of self. Yeah. Crucify the flesh. Don't build it up. And, you know, it, it's interesting. I don't remember what the show is, but, you know, the dating show where the wealthy guy mar just got married to a woman, right? Well, what's the show? The Bachelor. The Bachelor? Yeah, The Bachelor. Thank you. Stop watching that show. No, I'm just kidding. I, I don't, I don't <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. The, the Bachelor, right? They, they got married. This was like marriage made in heaven. It was, oh, they love each other. This is great. You know, I'm, I'm older. The, I don't know. The guy, I think, was in his 60s or something. And, you know, that's, that's all, the golden age, whatever that is. I don't know. And so this was supposed to be a, wonderful. Three months, they're getting divorced. Why? Because of self. First of all, I'm on the show because I need to find a woman. She needs to find a man. And look at how this all worked out. It didn't. It didn't. Well, here's the, out of this self-love, we see that they're lovers of money. And we talked about this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, where 
People are greedy for money and they'll sacrifice anything just to make themselves rich. How sad. You know, we saw that in, we see it in, you know, the health, wealth, prosperity stuff. You know, give me $100 and you get a tenfold back. Really? Why don't, why don't you give me $100 and you get a tenfold back? They don't never do that. But Timothy warned, or Paul warned Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There's the problem. Money is not the problem. It's the love of money. When people are trying to do things that are wrong to gain more and more money. Well, then there's the boasters and the proud and the blasphemers. You know, if self is controlling your life, this is what happens. Why? Because I'm going to boast because I'm the center of my universe. I'm number one. You boast in what you've done. You're proud. You think you're the greatest. Blasphemers in the Greek literally means to injure with speech. You know, we, we think of blasphemy, we think about, you know, God and, you know, slandering God, but uh, it also can use, be hurtful words directed towards people. Disobedient to parents. You think there's a problem today? Yeah. Be, it, it's sad. It's an epidemic. And, you know, if you look back, you look at some of the TV shows that were on, first I think it was the husbands that were losing their role as the parent, the father, and then it was the husband and wife that were losing their role to the children. The, the parents were like these goofy people that knew nothing, and the kids were running the family. And look at where we're at today. You know, I, I remember when my youngest son was in school many years ago, he was in grade school, he was told if we did something as parents that he didn't like, if we punished him, he could report us to the authorities. Yeah, not going to happen. He actually told us one time that his teacher told him that this is his room and we can't come in here. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, you pay me rent, you're more than happy to have this room, but until you do that, this house is mine and I have free access to every single room in this house lost control, and we've reaped what we've sown. I don't know, I, I shared this uh, report with you before, it's from the Minnesota Crime Commission, and it was, re it's really in line with what the Bible teaches about man's basic nature. It was done way back in 1926, but listen to what they said. This is amazing, what they said. Uh, he's, they wrote, every baby starts life as a little savage. Thank you. <laughs> he is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it, his bottle, his mother's attention, his playmates' toys, his uncle's watch. Deny him these once, and he sees with rage and aggressiveness, which would be murderous were he not so helpless. He is, in fact, dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in the self-centered world of his infancy, given free reign to his impulsive actions, to satisfy his wants, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, or a rapist. Exactly. That's why the Bible says, train up your children. But we haven't. And now, you know, people run from the police. Well, you committed a crime and you're running from the police. That, those are two bad things, right? We should have listened. And then there's being unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. You know, are we thankful to God for all that he's given us? And some of us may say, yeah, but you don't know, man. I've, I've had a hard life. It's been tough. Here's the thing. Bottom line, he's given you eternal life. Is there anything more that you need? No. No. But look at how much more God blesses us. It's, it's incredible. 
why are we so unthankful as Christians? I think sometimes it's because we look at what we don't have. Oh man, I wish I had that. Well, look at what you have. I mean, I'm so thankful. I mean, my wife and I, in a few weeks here, we're going to be married 45 years. I can't imagine being apart from her. I've been with her more than I've been apart from her. It's incredible what God has blessed me with. But he's given me eternal life, so how could I not be thankful to him for what he's given me? Unholy? Wow. Unloving? Without natural affection? Love today is a self-love. You know, again, we don't get what we want, we move on. I just don't feel like I love them anymore. Love's not a feeling. It's an act of your will. If love was a feeling, we'd all be in trouble because does, don't our feelings change from time to time? But when we know what God desires, we're never going to move from the course that God has for us. Unforgiving? We see this a lot today. God has forgiven us every single sin. Every single one. Yeah, but I, I, that person, I can't, no, I can't forgive them. Look at what they did. Well, let's take a look at what you did. Lord, put it on the screen. When you think about that, wow. Everything he's forgiven me. Now he says, just for, can you forgive that person like I've forgiven you? You can't do it in the flesh, guys. you got to surrender to the Spirit and let him give you that kind of love. Because it's unconditional. It's agape love. One writer said, These are those who refuse to change, no matter how desperate even their own situation becomes, much less the situations of those they should care about. They are determined to have their own way regardless of the consequences, even to the point of knowingly destroying their own lives and the lives of their families. They do not forgive and do not want to be forgiven. They are um, beyond reasoning, uh, self-destructive. As far as they are concerned, there is no compromise, no reconciliation, no, no court of appeal. Their self-love is so extreme and their egoism is so massive that absolutely nothing matters except doing as they please. Yeah. We, that's why as you read God's word, the Holy Spirit shows us what we need to change. And I don't think any of us, us have reached that perfection. Not in this life. You know, Paul says, I press on. I haven't reached it yet, but I'm pressing on. I'm looking to Jesus. I'm going to follow him. Lord, make me more like you. Slanderers, you know, false and malicious reports. Malicious gossips. It's interesting because it, um, it's a Greek word, uh, diabolos, from which we get our English word diabolical from. Uh, also accuser, used 34 times in the New Testament as a title for Satan. What? Yeah. Who are you working for? <laughs> right? That, these are tough ones. Things that we have to look at our own heart. How are we living out our faith? Not a pretty picture, but not intended to be. There's no self-control. And look at today. And our mottos, no rules, live outside the lines, do whatever seems right in your eyes. Yeah. It's interesting because these freedoms that we think we have, in these sins, take us captive. That's where we have to be careful. God knows what's best. Self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Paul talked about it in Galatians 5.23. Paul also talks about here brutal. Why brutal? Well, if you're self-centered and it's all about you, we become like wild animals. I mean, have you seen some of these things where, where, where people are just wailing on someone? They get out of their car and they're pulling some guy out of the car to beat him up because, I don't know, he didn't use a turn signal or, you know, he 
stopped at the red light and it turned green and he didn't move fast enough or something. Wow. Despisers of good. Yeah. You know, you look at some of this stuff, you go, I don't understand how you can say that that evil is good. It was interesting, they, um, on a television show, talk show, um, they had the, a son of a Hamas leader on. He became a Christian, uh, left Hamas, and they had two Palestinian women there. And he asked them, can you say that the October 7th invasion of Israel was wrong, that it was evil? And they couldn't. The rape, the murder, the burning of children, babies, they couldn't say it was wrong. Wow. That's where we're at. He also speaks, and this is all kind of lumped together, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Yeah. You know, when you're so focused on self, it doesn't matter. It's all about you. And all these things, you know, yeah. I'm going to do it my way. You know what? I've learned over the years, and I'm still learning from time to time, that God's way is the best. My way is really a mess many times, most of the time, all of the time. God's way. And I want to love God with all my heart, with all my being. And you know what? God blesses us as we do. Having a form of godliness, they're phonies, morph into their Christian form, you might say. You know, they're, they're Christian when they're around Christians and they are what the, like the world when they're around the world. And that's what we see, you know. Many times uh, the attitude is a salad bar religion. And what do I mean by a salad bar religion? I'll take this, I'll take this. Yeah, I'm not going to have that over there. And I'm just picking and choosing what I like and what I don't. No, you can't do that. And they lack the power to live because they lack the Spirit of God. They're not saved. You know, several years ago when Julie and I were on vacation at Fort, La Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I went down by the ocean to sit there for a little bit, and they had some benches there, and it's just so nice to be able to sit and, uh, you know, not be... Uh, having a winter jacket on and it's 20 degrees out, so it was really nice. But there was this homeless guy that came up to me and he was asking for money. And this guy was just swearing and cursing. And I mean, it was just one thing after another and I'm listening to him. And uh, I started talking about the Lord. All of a sudden, this guy became a Christian. His whole language changed. Everything he said was just, oh, it was so nice. And I thought, you know what? You've heard this so many times before, that you're just playing the game. You've morphed into a Christian because this is the person who's sitting in front of you is a Christian, and you're acting that way. You have, and I, I basically told him, you know, if you really need help, go to Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. They can help you. Yeah, that didn't happen. But it's interesting how his speech changed because his audience changed. And again, these 18 characteristics here all stem from men will be lovers of themselves. They didn't, they're not crucifying the flesh. They're not saved. You know, it, it's apostate Christians. They masquerade as a Christian. You know, over 100 years ago, J.C. Ryle wrote this. Look in another direction at those hundreds of people whose whole religion seems to consist in talk and high profession. They know the theory of the gospel intellectually and profess the delight in evangelical doctrine. 
They can say much about the soundness of their own views and the darkness of all who disagree with them, but they never get any further. When you examine their inner lives, you find that they know nothing of practical godliness. They are neither truthful, nor charitable, nor humble, nor honest, nor kind-tempered, nor gentle, nor unselfish, nor honorable. What shall we say of these people? They are Christians, no doubt, in name, and yet there is neither substance nor fruit in their Christianity. There is but one thing to be said. They are formal Christians. Their religion is an empty form. Yeah. And that's what Paul says. They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. They're not saved. You know, it's years ago I heard this story. I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of him to make me love a man of a different color or pick beets with a migrant worker. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Wow. God doesn't come in $3 portions. It's either all or nothing. It's as simple as that. And as we finish up here, we're going to look at Paul speaking about apostates. Look at verse 6 here in 2 Timothy 3. For, this sor for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, disapproved concerning the faith. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. So these false teachers, with their false doctrine, creep in. They slither into the church. They enter into homes, and they lead people, lead people away from the truth of God, and they lead people away from God. And the focus here is women. Why? Because they were home. And these men were hitting on them with their false teaching. Men are also taken in by false teachers as well with false doctrine. But they're always learning. But they're not able to come to the truth. Why? Because they're not interested in the truths of God found in the Word of God. They have their own ideas, and they'll run with these ideas until new ones come along. And they'll run with that. You know, I, I, there's a, a guy who calls me periodically, and I think he just goes through the churches and calls them periodically, who tries to tell me, he, he calls up with being very sly. He goes, uh, Pastor, can I ask you a question? And that's always a red flag for me, okay? You know, you don't say hi or anything, but can I ask you a question? Sure, go ahead. No, I'm open. And he goes, Jesus never said he was God. And it was kind of interesting because the last time he called, we were going through the Gospel of John, which the whole Gospel is showing that Jesus is God. And so I, I went through verses, and he had his way of denying it. He didn't want to. I said, well, you know, Jesus said, if you don't believe I am, you will die in your sins. He goes, well, it doesn't mean that he was God. It just means that he is. I said, uh, no. When he said, if you do not believe I am, he was saying, I'm Almighty God. I was a voice in the burning bush. If you don't believe that, you're going to die in your sins. So I'm talking to him. We're going through Scripture. And finally, the guy's now yelling at me. Okay? And I finally said, you know, we need to end this now because it's going nowhere. And if this is how you're witnessing to me, you really need to work on it because yelling is not doing it. <laughs> yelling doesn't convince me. It just shows me you have nothing to stand upon. And that was the end of the conversation. Yeah. Wow. You know, deception is playing a big role in the last days. We see it in the world, right? I mean, whatever you want to believe, go to Facebook or go to the Internet. You can find whatever you want to believe to be true. It's hard to know what truth is. Oh, wait, 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 let me correct that. Jesus said that the word is truth. So there's my source. It's hard because there are so many 
people with degrees that tell you what's going on and they don't they contradict each other i trust what god's word has to say uh, that's the bottom line to me why do people fall prey to this because it makes them feel good uh, when it, it, people come up to me oh you, you won't believe this i, I got to show you because this has never been seen before oh yeah <laughs> i wonder why because it's not true you mean for 2,000 years nobody saw this in the scriptures, and now you're telling me this new doctrine, and sorry, show me. I actually have one guy who was trying to show me that you know, the rapture doesn't, is not true, the Bible never speaks about the rapture. I said, well, show me, explain it to me. And he spent 20 minutes telling me that it's so complicated he doesn't have enough time to tell me. We just spent 20 minutes. Just tell me. What is the reason? And he never could. And again, it's pride. It's self-love. And I try to be open. You know, Jehovah Witnesses come to my door. Mormons come. Tell me. I'm open. I'll read your material. Come back. We'll talk. They don't, but... Because I know the truth will always set me free from the lies that are out there. But they're always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And it's so sad that they keep promoting this. And, and, and Paul mentions these two guys, Janus and Jambres, the Egyptian men who opposed Moses before Pharaoh in Exodus. Now, are these symbolic names? Well, they could be. I think that they're the real names. But Janus means he who seduces. Jambres means he who makes a rebellion. And... It's interesting because when God did a miracle through Moses, these men, by the power of darkness, copied it up to a point. Only up to a point. We have to be careful because the enemy does lying signs and wonders. In fact, that's what the Antichrist is going to do. And we won't be here for that, but it's crazy. We need to stick to what God has said in his word. Satan is an imitator. Well, it, it's amazing how people get duped in. You know, you've got the gold dust falling, or the guy who's got a bad tooth and he gets a gold tooth, you know. And I, I'm thinking, why didn't God just heal his tooth? Because a gold tooth's not going to do a whole lot of good. Pull it out and cash it in, but, you know, you're missing a tooth then. Does God do miracles today? Absolutely, but you know where they're coming from. And we don't follow after signs and wonders. Signs and wonders follow after us. We just serve the Lord and let God work. Amen. But these teachers have corrupt minds and disapproved concerning the faith. And the word disapproved speaks of rejected. That's what they need to be, rejected. How sad. And they're going to progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as their, theirs also was. Yeah, they can cause great damage within the church. They can hurt a lot of people, but like Janus and Jambres were exposed and their power was shown not to be from the true and living God, they, they'll be exposed as well. They're not going to be able to stand. These false teachers on the day of God's judgment, can you imagine? And the warning is there about this coming apostasy, and I think we're living in it. We're seeing it. And what are we going to do about it? And that's next time, as we look at here in 2 Timothy, confronting apostasy. What do we do? What should we do about this? But remember what Jesus said in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Praise God for that. We don't have to be deceived. Take what you hear. I tell you, even what I teach, I'm a man. I'm not God. You take what I teach, like they did with Paul in Berea. They took what he taught and they compared it to the scriptures to see what he was saying, if it was true. It keeps me accountable and it keeps you safe. That's important. We need to heed those words of Jesus that the truth will make us free. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you again for your word. And Lord, it's not an easy subject, and Lord, but it's, you have it here, and we have to deal with it, we have to understand it, we have to apply these things to our lives so we can grow in our relationship with you. And Lord, some of these characteristics, yeah, we have to deal with. Because of self-love, it's, it's there in our lives and we have to crucify the flesh. And, and Lord, we want to be able to have people look at us and see your love, to see you. We're to have your nature flow from our lives. Help us, Lord, to be more like you. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.